I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to disappoint anybody in the uh, audience right now, but uh, so uh, the talk is not about microservices, if you are uh, thinking about that. So um, I'm not going to talk about the characteristics of microservices uh, or like, you know, uh, if you go to uh, Martin Fowler's definition of microservices, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a project, it's, it's a product. Uh, dumb pipes and smart endpoints, decentralized uh, governance, decentralized data planes. Um, so I, I assume every one of you in this audience have gone through a lot of papers about microservices, have gone through talks about microservices, so I don't have to go through those kind of small details. So I, I try to concentrate on the beyond aspect and try to follow up with what Asanka talked about uh, with the cell architecture, et cetera, and how, uh, how we are thinking about uh, beyond microservices and containers. And I'm not, talking, not going to talk about containers as well, right? So uh, when I talked with some customers, uh, where I'm not saying this is wrong or uh, this is the right way to do it, but some people start with you know, a, a, a term that I hear very often is lift and shift, right? So we, I have a monolith today. Let's just lift it and shift it to a container. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that pattern where you just take a big old application and just put, uh, put a wrapper container around it and deploy it in Kubernetes or so, you know, OpenShift or uh, in a container orchestration platform. So there are good ways of doing it. There are enough resources around uh, that, that discusses uh, how to do those things, et cetera. Um, so yeah, so um, let's, let's talk about those things first. But first of all, I want to take a minute and appreciate the history. Um, so so if, if you are looking at the slide, uh, in 1974, uh, we, we got the understanding of internet on how it works. And uh, in 85, we understood how TCP IP works, right? And by 92, there was something called World Wide Web, and Tim Berners-Lee talked about HTTP, et cetera. In 93, there's a browser, one web browser called Mosaic, and awesomely, surprisingly, 94, there was a pizza uh, application or pizza website selling pizza uh, on the web, right? So, um, so that's how things came into being. So if you, if you just uh, take a quick look at um, of that past, where we are coming from, um, there were no services. Before all this microservice stuff, there were no services at all some random code of some functions running in a mainframe. After my talk, Amila is going to talk about ser serverless architecture, et cetera, et cetera. You might find some similarity to of those days in those architectures, but of course, in improved manner. Then, uh, then we came to RPC uh, age, COBA, DCOM, those kind of uh, technologies. Uh, the main problem there was the, the, the technology inventors ignored the fallacies of distributed computing. So if, you've, if you know those uh, seven attributes of fallacies of distributed computing, you know, let's just, you know, forgetting about the distributed nature of the systems and just try to program the distributed computing platform as a local computer, and that is the main uh, problem, right? So there, uh, even, even, before, uh, before two systems get connected, there can be a uh, scenario where the message never delivers to the end platform, where there will be a scenario where the network is not available. So those kind of things were not uh, captured in uh, those old technologies. Then there was service-oriented architecture, and we, uh, today we, use, um, uh, we see a lot of service-oriented implementations, uh, and it is great. But the problem with SOA is it is a lot of framework bloat a lot of standard bloat, uh, a lot of vendors gave their biased opinions about service or architecture. So if you are using uh, IBM ESB, a Microsoft ESB, it's not the real WS star specification that you're using. You, you, the, some of the WS reliable messaging specifications, WS atomic transaction specifications, have the vendor specific components included, so the portability aspect is not there. So those kind of things was, uh, uh, it didn't really pick up and it, it created problems. Right, so, so let's look at the continuous innovation. And I happened to found that the paper in 94, I think, uh, when Pizza Hut came online, 
uh, and how it was uh, published, right? So I, I want to take like a minute and just read this a little bit, and it, it's really awesome uh, to hear it. Using the internet's World Wide Web to access the centralized PizzaNet server in Pizza Hut headquarters in Wichita, Kansas, customers see a customized menu for ordering their pizzas. Customers then enter their vital statistics along with the other pizza orders, uh, with the orders and beverages. The data is then transmitted via the internet back to Wichita, then relayed via a modem and conventional phone lines to computer system computers nearest Pizza Hut. Uh, to minimize the risk of digital pizza pranksters, the local restaurant then telephones the user, verify the order, and money transaction happens offline. This is awesome, right? So if you think about it, okay, this is age-old ancient technology. That's, that's what your initial opinion, right, if you read about it. But if you second read it again, what are we doing different here? What are we doing different now in this workflow? So I, I drew it, you know? So 94 in the left-hand side, 2018, right-hand side. The workflow is almost the same, and you can see continuous improvement in every layer. That's the awesome part of it. Today, you don't just uh, go to World Wide Web and then order a pizza, right? How, how many of you uh, order pizza on your laptop today? The most uh, the, the novel way of doing it is ask Alexa to order it, right? Then Alexa calls the uh, uh, API in Pizza Hut uh, data center, which is not in Kansas, with, uh, in, in, not in Wichita in Kansas. It's in uh, a VPC in AWS, probably. I don't know. We are not working with Pizza Hut. Um, then there'll be a push notification coming to a system in the most closest uh, uh, platform and then the Pizza Hut, uh, uh, the delivery guy will just deliver. And before delivering, Alexa will tell you, hey, your pizza is five minutes away. And that's real-time feedback notification. Right, so the workflow is the same, but you can see improvements in every layer. Use experience, awesome. The speed, efficiency, loop, uh, the feedback. You get it, you know where the pizza is. If you have done Uber Eats, if I order something, I know when the, when the guys left the restaurant, when I'm getting, the, getting my pizza, right? The communication, it, it, it rarely will be web. It is mostly mobile, and now you have voice assisted. Server-side workloads, it's mostly, all right? Um, it mostly um, uh, on, on a scalable uh, distributed platform in the cloud. It can be AWS, it can be Google, Microsoft, some cloud platform. Business workflows, very much improved, efficient, productive, and accuracy is improved, and you get a lot of feedback from the business point of view. All right, so I, I want to um, think about this a little bit. So uh, we had an architecture session a few weeks back, uh, and, and we want to define this modern computer, define the moder modern distributed computer. So this is what uh, uh, Tyler, Tyler's definition, and, and we, we happily agreed on this, it, it really, talks about what we are talking today and what Asanka talked about in his talk. Uh, what is the modern computer? What is the modern com uh, distributed computer? It's logic that runs. It's this transactional data flow, or you can call it transactional data plane, distributed control plane, and DevOps iterations and pipelines that tie all these three together. That's pretty much it, right? OK, so let's dig in a little bit. Logic that runs. Organize around capabilities, which we are talking about with microservices, right? If you follow microservices architectures, it's all about organize around capabilities. And that's what our cell-based architecture is all about, right? Organize the cell around the capabilities. It has a bounded contest. It, it's about the domain-driven design, that good, good stuff from the domain-driven design. Performance is optimized. Today's workloads are massively complex. Even a marginal performance improvement will give you uh, better cost efficiencies and cost uh, uh, massive gains in your expenses. Um, independent and own its own data. So this, this is improvement. This, this, is, this is what Martin Fowler talked about, distributed uh, data uh, ownership, right? So if I'm writing a microservice, my microservice, my microservice will create data and consume data, and it will have its own data, data store. 
and with that pattern you can you know think about architectural patterns like CQRS, like uh, command query separation, those kind of patterns. Less in importance in interop. So this is where we deviate from service-oriented architecture. Service-oriented architecture talked a lot about interoperability. That's why the standards were really, really important, right? But today, less importance about interoperability, but more importance on the agility and the developer productivity, right? Um, why, why that is, we can, we can, we'll, we'll look into those, uh, those, those uh, reasons. But today, you, you should empower the developer. If that person is good in Java, that guy should write uh, his microservice in Java. If he's good in Ballerina, he should write his microservice in Ballerina. Go, Python, whatever, right? And, and then uh, you, can, you can release a MVP of a product very soon and hook it up uh, to an API platform and expose those capabilities. And then the transactional data flow. This is the data plane uh, stuff comes in. Today with microservices, we try to make things more reactive, more event-driven. So this is where things deviate from an ESB, right? When, when it comes to ESBs, ESB is all about centralized control, right? You put a ESB platform or ESB cluster in the middle, and you do all the orchestration inside the ESB. And that is a central piece of middleware that connects to a bunch of services, and ESB is intelligent. It knows how to orchestrate, it knows how to talk to this service, get the response, talk to another one, and get the response. But today we try to make um, that more event-driven as possible, and that's what uh, the dumb pipe concept is about. Make the pipe so dumb, make the endpoints intelligent. But if you step back and think about it, is it realistic? So that's where, for me, I think a hybrid model is more, more uh, more ap applicable. So you can see in the diagram, the, the diagram in the below, um, there can be scenarios where you, can, you might want to have a blocking, synchronous kind of a flow. In that case, you can have one microservice, you can call it an orchestration microservice, that calls a bunch of other microservices to do a, a blocking, synchronous orchestration flow. And that can participate in an event-driven flow uh, in a dump pipe. So you have an event stream, a stream of events, that has a bunch of topics defined. Each microservice will put a message and a relevant, uh, and the a pipe will deliver it to the relevant uh, microservice. And then the microservice will do the logic, the data transformation, and, um, and participate in the flow. So with that, now you want to have a control, some control aspect. Uh, there is security, there is metrics, discovery, uh, access control policies, uh, traffic management policies. So how, do you go, uh, how are you going to apply those things? So in, in a cell-based architecture or in a capability-centric architecture, you need to have a control plane that is local to that capability set. So that's where the distributed control plane will come into the picture. Emphasis on distributed governance. So it will have its own directory of the services, the matrices using, you know, in, in uh, in Kubernetes and microservices terms, you know, your Prometheus, your dashboards, everything will run there in the control plane. And you will define your policies, your ACLs, and inject into your local gateways, uh, which is inside the same pod in, the, uh, in a Kubernetes architecture. So this is a high-level view, but you can apply the reference implementations into a Kubernetes-based platform. So you can, say, uh, you can see in the bottom uh, diagram, you can see there are two, uh, two uh, cells. The cell has a gateway, Asang talked about that, and then you can have an event stream, control plane local to the cell, and, and controlling that cell, uh, cell model. Tying up all those three together, DevOps. So this is the most uh, empowering aspect of this. Earlier, uh, I would say five years back, DevOps is not improved enough uh, so the developers can play with any of their favorite technologies. That was the problem, right? Because DevOps is so improved today that you can think about automation as code today. You can empower developers and ask them to play in their safe zones, right? Write the code as you want, check it into JIT, we'll bundle it, we'll create a composite and deploy and orchestrate into orchestration platform. So, so this is really important. So, if you are not investing today on DevOps, 
on automation, uh, there's new concepts like JITOPS, where you treat GitHub or JIT-based system or version control system as the source of truth, and use JIT hooks to see diffs in test staging and production, and, um, and have alerts based on that. I think that's where you have to prioritize and invest on. And then while, while doing that, you can empower all the developers to uh, play in their uh, you know, uh, expert areas or uh, happy, uh, happy corners. And I like this, uh, this term. So uh, Randy Bias uh, is, the, is the guy who really coined this term. There, there's no pets anymore. There's this concept of pets versus cattle, right? Um, so if I, if I try to relate this, uh, all of you probably uh, are deploying some WC2 product, WC2 ESP, WC2 API manager. You treat them as, you treat those uh, pieces of infrastructure as pets today. That's why if, if the gateway goes down, you call WC2 and we try to solve this, solve the problem, et cetera. You love that piece of technology. You don't want that piece of technology to go down. What we're trying to move is we, we trying to move away from that. So you, you won't have to call WS2. Uh, not, not, not the point. So you see, you'll still call WS2, but the, the thing is, if, the, if a ESB node, if a micro ESB node or, or a, a container node or a local gateway node goes down, you should not care about it, right? It, it, that's why we, we correlate that to a cattle. You have heard of cattle, like heard of cows, and if one cow is not producing enough milk, you just replace that cow, right? So you treat your infrastructure as cattle today, not as pets. So that's the whole point. Right, so we, 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 are talking, we talked about how you use microservices and how you use containers in a real world implementation and how you should treat about this modern computer, how you should think about this modern computer. Let's think a little bit about the beyond stuff. Future is mostly going to be code, compute, and storage. That's, what, that's where the world is heading towards. There, there, there is no uh, you know, low-code scenarios to handle complex problems. If you, are, if you are dealing complex integration scenarios, complex problem solving, then it will be just code, compute, and storage. You can do today with all that custom code and custom uh, code for mediation because you have improved DevOps processes. That's why the emphasis on DevOps. When I talk to some customers, um, uh, they, what they usually say when, when they explain their deployment, what they say is, hey, we do a lot of mediation stuff with custom code. That's where the world is heading in the future as well. The thing is, the custom code today is very scary, but the custom code in the future will not be that scary because you have enough observability you have enough automation, uh, so you are very comfortable with that orchestration in code. Logic transaction workflows will be just code. So the, the orchestration that you do, the logic you write anyway in code, workflows you do is mostly event-driven and, and reactive. They will be in code, and you will do a lot of stream processing, checking out uh, from a stream, uh, picking out from a topic, etc. So, Asanga talked about this in a very high level. Um, so this is a shift towards a, 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 a very flat kind of a view of, of a distributed system. Earlier, if you are uh, you know, designing a platform, you are thinking about a data services layer, then an integrations layer, then an API layer, then a presentation layer. But if you are developing a platform today, you are just thinking about capabilities. That's pretty much it. You will have some data services, you will have some business services, you'll have some workflow services, some statistic services. They are not layered, they are in a, um, in a bounded context, which is a business domain. And that's what we are calling as a cell. And you can deploy it as a Kubernetes namespace, or you can relate it to some kind of a reference implementation. Um, so yeah, so that's a, a shift from how you are thinking about the world. And you, sh we are going back to a distributed global supercomputer. So this is like, this is like a, a, a super mainframe, right? So earlier you had a mainframe in your company and you wrote functions in that computer. 
you, and that computer ran it. But today, this distributed global supercomputer is in AWS, or in Google, or in Azure, or maybe another cloud giant will come and create another platform, right? But, but, but I don't see that organizations will own infrastructure anymore. The computer will be there in the cloud. The infrastructure is there. You just lease the compute and the storage. And then you write code on top of that. You, your bill pipelines will run on top of that. Um, yeah, and, and uh, security, privacy, compliance, all those GDPR, HIPAA stuff will be provided in that platform. Uh, developers will deploy code to a global supercomputer, and that's what serverless is about. Um, and you just lease computing. All right, so um, that brings us to the summary. Um, so we took a moment to appreciate the history. We, we, we checked the innovation at every layer. We, we looked at the modern computing system and the definition of it, how we see it. Um, and, and we talked about this pet versus cattle analogy. There's no special infrastructure. And the centralized layered deployment architecture is retiring slowly. And compute and storage is leased. And cold deeds push to a distributed supercomputer. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's what I want to talk about. Any questions? Cool. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll be outside. Uh, we, we have some working things along these concepts. Uh, we can discuss about this, uh, those things. Um, I'll be outside in the oxygen bar. Thanks. <laughs>